Cameron. It's July 3rd, so happy Independence Day tomorrow. Uh, I think last year, Sunday actually fell on I think it did. the 4th, uh, but presumably they'll all be tomorrow, and um, I hope you all have a good, happy, and safe Independence Day. Um, let's see here. For Rising Hope, do we know? Mayonnaise in July. So, mayonnaise. Uh, I think that also includes Miracle Whip, yes. which my mother would tell you does not count it as mayonnaise. Not mayonnaise. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, and, and there, were, there, there have been times when I myself have used Miracle Whip. I, well, don't tell my mother that I did it. Um, so, do you, do you have a preferred brand of milk? I like Kraft. Kraft. Yeah, I think Kraft is pretty, <laughs> just kind of a good. Mm -hmm. We use Hellman's. Hellman's. All right. And Carl, do you have a preferred? I don't use. You don't use mayonnaise? No, it is. Oh. Butter. But, butter. As in, like on a sandwich, you would put <clears throat> butter in lieu, of, uh, in lieu of mayonnaise, for example? When is butter not good? I mean. Thank you, Paula Dean. <laughs> uh, Howard, do you have a preferred? We're split. I'm Miracle Whip. My oh. wife is Hellman's. Oh, it's a mixed marriage. <laughs> <laughs> but, but she uses both in certain things. Like oh, potato salad. Okay, salad she uses salad. both. That's very interesting. Yeah, <laughs> that's very interesting. Um, I think I don't know. My mother would probably, you know, my my prefer. I mean, this is the big. I don't even know if I've never seen it here. Bama. I don't know if y'all have Bama. <laughs> brand you know what i'm talking about yeah, bama brand it's like if you could squeeze more fat in the mayonnaise like bama they're doing that they figured out a way to make it uh it, it so yeah but it, that's delicious mayonnaise okay so dukes is pretty good i like dukes mayonnaise yeah uh okay for that's rising hope mayonnaise for koinonia this month we are preparing for August Angels. August is coming up. School will be starting soon. So uh, we'll have more information on that in the next few mm -hmm. weeks. But this month we're going to be focusing on school supplies, getting ready for August Angels. And we'll have a list of which supplies and items are needed in the weeks to come. We'll send out emails as well as make announcements. Yep. All right. Well, uh, I think that's about I think that's it. That's about it. Uh, let us go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we give thanks to you this morning for this opportunity to worship and to fellowship with one another. We Please, Lord, help us to hold each other accountable in Christian love and to encourage one another in our faith. Forgive us our sins. Wash us clean of our inequities for the sake of your Son, Jesus. Open our hearts and minds to your word this morning. Aid us in our understanding and help us to be joyfully obedient to your commandments and mindful of the laws and lessons of Jesus. We give thanks this morning especially for the freedoms that you have given us in our nation. We give thanks, O oh Lord, for those who have given their lives in service to our country. We pray, Lord, that you would help us not to abuse our freedoms but to use them for the good of our fellow man. That's, that's God calling right now. We pray all this in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. All right. Um, don't feel bad. It happens. It happens. Um, uh, while we're at it, if anybody else might want to check your phones, just make sure they're off. Um, we're going to sing number 66 this morning. Praise my soul, the King of Heaven. And we're going to sing verses 1 and 4.
Thank you very much. First reading from Second Kings, Mr. Carl Bond. Oh, here you are. Hey. A reading from the book of Second Kings, chapter 5, verses 1 through 14. Now Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Syria, was a great and honorable man in the eyes of his master, because by him the Lord had given victory to Syria. He was also a mighty man of valor, but a leper. And the Syrians had gone out on raids and had brought back captive a young girl from the land of Israel. She waited on Naaman's wife. Then she said to her mistress, If only my master were with the prophet who is in Samaria, for he would heal him of his leprosy. And Naaman went in and told his master, saying, Thus and thus said the girl who is from the land of Israel. Then the king of Syria said, Go now, and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So he departed and took with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten changes of clothing. Then he brought the letter to the king of Israel, which said, Now be advised, when this letter comes to you, that I have sent Naaman my servant to you, that you may heal him of his leprosy. And it happened when the king of Israel read the letter that he tore his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and make alive that this man sends a man to me to heal him of his leprosy? Therefore, please consider and see how he seeks a quarrel with me. And so it was when Elisha, the man of God heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, that he sent to the king, saying, Why have you torn your clothes? Please let him come to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. The Naaman went with his horses and chariot, and he stood at the door of Elisha's house. And Elisha sent a messenger to him, saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored to you, and you shall be clean. But Naaman became furious and went away and said, Indeed, I said to myself, He will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord it, his God and wave his hand over the place and heal the leprosy. Are not the Abana and the Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. And his servants came near and spoke to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do something great, would you not have done it? How much more then when he says to you, Wash and be clean? So he went down and dipped seven times in the Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God, and his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. The word of God for the people of God. Thank you to God. A reading from Psalm 30, verses 1 to 12. I will extol you, O Lord, for you have lifted me up and did not let my foes rejoice over me. O Lord, my God, I cried to you for help, and you healed me. O Lord, you brought up my soul from Sheol, restored me to life among those gone down to the pit. Sing praises to the Lord, O his faithful ones, and give thanks to his holy name. Surely the Lord's anger is but for a moment. The Lord's favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes with the morning. As for me, I say in my prosperity, I shall never be moved. By your favor, O Lord, you have established me as a strong mountain. You hid your face. I was dismayed. To you, O Lord, I cried. And to the Lord, I made supplication. What profit is there in my death if I go down to the pit? Will the dust praise you? Will it tell of your faithfulness? 
Hear, O Lord, and be gracious to me. O Lord, be my helper. You have turned my mourning into dancing. You have loosened my sackcloth and girded me with gladness, that my soul may praise you and not be silent. O Lord, my God, I will give thanks to you forever. Amen. Amen. A reading from St. Paul's letter to the Galatians, chapter 6, verses 1 through 16. Brethren, if a man overtakes in any tra trespass, you, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceives himself, but lest each one examine his own work, and then he will have rejoicing in himself alone, and not in another, for each one shall bear his own load. Let him who is taught the word share it all in all good things with him who teaches. Do not be deceived, God is not mocked, for whatever a man sows that he will also reap for he who sows in fields will of the flesh reap corruption but he who sows of the spirit will of the spirit reap everlasting life and let us not grow weary while doing good for in the in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart therefore as we have opportunity let us do good to all, especially those who are in the household of faith. See with what large letters I have written to you with my own hand, as many as desire to make a good showing in the flesh, though these would compel you to be circumcised, only by they may not suffer persecution for the cross of Christ, but not for even those who are circumcised keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. But God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been crucified to, to me and I to the world. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but a new creation. This may, and as many as walk according to this rule, peace and misery, mer peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Our second hymn for today, uh, number 163, Ask Me What ye. Great Thing. Ask. Ye. A, a, oh, it says me right you. here. I'm sorry, it says ye right here. Oh, I was reading it off the song, the, the, the bulletin. A typo. A typo. Finally, Carol has one I'm not you being a regular bulletin. You don't time. see that? You don't see that? Admitted too often, <laughs> let me just say. All right. Um, 163, Ask Ye What Great Things I Know. We're going to sing verses, uh, is it one through, is that correct? Is it one and four? Yes, it is. Oh, just want to make sure. Can't trust anything on this paper now. All right, <laughs> one and four. <laughs>
All right. Um, you, you probably need it. Okay. Um, the gospel this morning, the Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, chapter 10, verses 1 through 11 and 16 through 20. After these things, the Lord appointed 70 others also and sent them two by two before his face into every city and place where he himself was about to go. And then he said to them, the harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go your way. Behold, I send you out as lambs among wolves. Carry neither money bag, knapsack, nor sandals, and greet no one along the road. But whatever house you enter, first say, peace to this house. And if the son of peace is there, your peace will rest on it. If not, it will return to you and remain in the same house, eating and drinking such things as they give, for the laborer is worthy of his wages. Do not go from house to house. Whatever city you enter and they receive you, eat such things as are set before you and heal the sick there and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. But whatever city you enter and they do not receive you, Go out into its streets and say, <clears throat> The very dust of your city which clings to us, we wipe off against you. Nevertheless, know this, that the kingdom of God has come near you. To verse 16. He who hears you hears me, and he who rejects me, and he who rejects me, him who sent me. And the seventy returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and all over the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. The Gospel of our Lord. <laughs> sends out the 70s, and we're going to come back to that. But I want to begin with this wonderful story of Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Syria. Now, Syria, uh, in, 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 well, I don't expect y'all to have a geography map, you know, by, uh, but Syria is right there. I mean, Damascus and, and Jericho, th those things are Syria. So it's really kind of the, the kind of hometown rival of Israel. You know, it's right there. And so, you know, if, if, if we were back home in Aberdeen, Syria would be like Amory. That's our cross-telling rivals, you know, the Amory Panthers. And it just hurts my mouth to even have to utter their name. I mean, that's how bitter this rivalry is. Um, but here, I suppose it would be like um, Maryland. I, you know, like, that's what we're having to, to deal with. So Syria has been a long time uh, enemy of Israel. And, you know, when they're at peace, it's always tenuous. It's always, you know, what's going to happen next. So Naaman is their head general. You know, I mean, he's the chairman of the Joint Chiefs. And uh, he was great. Uh, he, you know, he's a tough guy. And he's an honorable man in the eyes of his master. Uh, and it says, because by him the Lord had given victory to Syria. And the author of the text is basically saying, look, if Syria is winning, that's obviously God is permitting that or blessing that. Uh, he's a mighty man of valor, but he had leprosy. Now, you know, I'm not a 
doctor and I'm not uh, an expert on leprosy, but from what I understand, uh, it, it, it can kind of start slowly. It doesn't necessarily just take you over all at once. And as we all know in Israel, they had a standing rule, uh, you know, if you had leprosy, you were considered unclean, both, you know, sort of socially and religiously, and you would go live in a leper colony uh, to prevent the spread of the disease because it's communicable by touch. And if you didn't stay in that colony, if you tried to get out of that colony, they'd stone you. They'd kill you. Um, Syria, I really don't know what kind of rules. I would imagine that in most cases it was similar because they figured out you, you, if, if the lepers are running loose, they'll spread it. But Naaman's different. I mean, this is, you know, this is the, the head general of your army. He's won all these battles. And so the king's like, just keep it down, you know, wrap up your whatever it is, arm, leg, whatever. And, you know, we'll try to, you know, you've earned the respect. We're not going to treat you like a normal person. And uh, so Naaman has a certain, uh, I mean, he's, he's earned a great deal of esteem and the king respects him a great deal. But Naaman has a pretty high opinion of himself. He's not like other men. Uh, to quote Waylon Jennings, I ain't no ordinary dude. I got my name on my shirt. Uh, you know, that's one of my, my favorite lines. Um, it's, uh, he's, his self-appraisal is pretty high. He doesn't consider himself as normal people. So, um, they, the Syrians had gone out on raids like they do, and they brought back a captive girl from Israel. And so uh, she waited on Naaman's wife. Um, and so, you know, evidently this girl may have been fairly talented or whatever, because Naaman, the, the head general's wife grabbed this girl who they captured and said, you can work for me. And she says to her mistress, uh, if only my master were with the prophet who is in Samaria, for he would heal him of his leprosy. I think there's some important foreshadowing here. Uh, this is 2 Kings. Already, they are referring to northern Israel as Samaria. Right? Did you catch that? And that's an important distinction. They, they are not, she did not refer to it as Israel. She referred to it as Samaria. So there's already this interplay, and the Samaritans are partly responsible for this, of the Israelites intermarrying and not necessarily, you know, they, they may have worshipped Yahweh and had some household gods. This is, this is always the issue with Israel. Um, when they talk about the Samaritans had, had sort of inner married and, and, and interbred outside of Israel, it's not just that they'd married foreigners. It's that they had adopted foreign customs to include foreign religion. And so this is one of the biggest, you know, kind of points of condemnation for the Jews, those of the tribes of Judah, Levi, and Benjamin, who were in Judea around Jerusalem, and of course also Galilee, but their biggest you know, point of condemnation for the Samaritans is that they had been unfaithful. So not only had they married foreigners, which they were not supposed to do, but they had adopted their religion. And so in some areas of Samaria, they might have the old temple at Bethel uh, where they worship Yahweh. And then at their house, they might have around the hearth some household gods from the person that they married or there might even be another altar outside town to some of these foreign gods. And, and this, this is obviously a problem. So that's, that's already starting to happen. And that's why she calls it Samaria instead of Israel. It's already going on. So um, it has, for he would heal him of leprosy. And Naaman went in and told his master, this is the king, Thus and thus said the girl who is from the land of Israel. Now that tells you he's desperate. I mean, he knows he's got a death sentence. And so, you know, whatever this, this you know, this slave girl and the, and, this, and the Syrians look down on Israel. 
Look, she says, well, my wife, this girl works for my wife. She says there's this prophet in, in Samaria, and she says he can heal me. And so the king of Syria, he, he's, this is his friend, and he loves this guy. He says, go now. I'll send a letter to the king of Israel. And so, you know, um, he, he brought the letter to the king and um, says, now be advised when this letter comes to you, I've sent Naaman, my servant, to you that you may heal him of leprosy. And so now the king of Israel is really upset. Like he is furious because he feels like the pressure is on him. You're like, am I God uh, to kill and make alive? This man sends a man to me to heal him of this leprosy. Uh, and he says, please consider, he's starting a war. He sent his commanding general over here for me to heal him of an incurable death sentence disease. And what's going to happen if I can't? I got to send him back over there, still with his leprosy uncured, and we're going to have a war again with Syria? Is that what this is? He's picking a fight? Uh, so it was. Elisha, the man of God, heard the king of Israel had torn his clothes. He said to the king, saying, Why have you torn your clothes? Please let him come to me, and, and, uh, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. I want you all to note, here, they call it Israel again. King of Israel sent to Israel. So we're in this time period where it's, it's kind of this back and forth. And we saw this all the way in Kings 18 when Elijah has to what? Ahab and Jezebel had adopted as the king and queen of Israel foreign gods, Baal and these other foreign terrible gods. Um, and Elijah is fighting for monotheism to Yahweh. So it, we're at a time in history when this back and forth between is Israel as opposed to Judea, but northern Israel going to be faithful or is it going to become kind of a part of the world? Is it going to remain monotheistic to Jehovah? Or is it going to become polytheistic like the world? And, and I recently, <laughs> I read a good argument where these uh, modern scholars trying to sort of undermine the biblical account said, you know, our uh, latest research would indicate that uh, Israel was not monotheistic, but in fact uh, had many gods they worshipped, especially in northern Israel, to which a, uh, a biblical scholar responded, uh, yes, like is recorded in all of the prophets, that they, <laughs> they were basically fighting against this polytheism that had invaded northern Israel, and that this is basically why the Jews separated themselves and they became the Samaritans and uh, Southern Israelites became the Jews. So that's, that reading is not anti-biblical. In fact, that's the consistent story of what the Bible tells us occurred. Um, so um, Elisha says, yeah, send him on over here. Naaman went with his horses and chariot. So he didn't just like ride his horse on over there. I mean, he went with his whole deal. Uh, you could imagine, our chairman of the Joint Chiefs, General Milley, you know, former chief of staff of the Army, you can imagine he shows up like in a Abrams tank. You know, he's, he's there in his machine of war to remind everybody. He's got his stars painted on the side. He's there to remind everybody, uh, I'm the commander of Syria. And so, um, uh, stood at the door. He himself stood at the door of Alicia's house. And Elisha sent a messenger to him. Elisha doesn't even come to the door. And he says, go wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored to you, and you shall be clean. I mean, it's very clear. If you'll go do this, you'll be all right. Naaman was furious and went away indeed and said, uh, I said to myself, he will surely come out to me and stand and call the name of the Lord and wave his hand over the place and heal the leprosy. Are not the Abana and the far, far, the rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel? Uh, you know, could I just not wash in them? If this, in other words, if this guy is not even going to come out here and talk to me, 
Why did I even come over here? You know, if this is the great prophet who has the power to heal me, and I'm not even going to get to see him, I could have stayed home. I got better rivers and waters and stuff at home. Why, why am I even here? If this guy's not going to even come out, you know, and, and you get it. Uh, the man has a sense of importance, some of which he feels that he has earned. Um, but there's all, I mean, there's a little bit to that. Like I, you know, um, I always, I always talk about some of our experiences. He's not me. Kate's been very blessed. But I've, I've met General Milley, for example. Uh, it's been some years ago, but I remember meeting him. And I was so excited because, I mean, you know, we were there and, and Secretary Mattis was there. We were at the Commandant's quarters for some event. And so we're down at downtown at 8th and I. And I got to meet Commandant, whoever the Commandant was at that time. And I got to meet the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, who uh, Dun General Dunford at, at that time. I think Neller was the commandant, and uh, and all these Marines. I mean, and they're they're great. I have nothing but excellent things to say. They're all fine gentlemen and tough guys. But I wasn't a Marine, and so you know, all the Joint Chiefs were there, and I was really excited to meet General Milley. I mean, you know, that's my guy, right? That's the Army, and he's you know former Green Beret and all this stuff. And so, um, you know, it's kind of casual. I wore my suit. I tried to be dressed appropriately. It was 4th of July. And he's just talking to people. And uh, I, I just went through kind of the receiving line. It was very informal. We were just outdoors. And I just stuck out my hand. And I said, General Milley, uh, it's very nice to meet you. Um, uh, my name's Oliver Box, and I am uh, served in the Army briefly, and I'm a uh, pastor. And he looked at me just kind of briefly and said, who are you? And I said, oh, uh, I'm a spouse. My, my wife, Kate, works for Secretary Mattis. And he just kind of looked at me and he said, okay. And, and that was it. That was it. I mean, he's in his full, you know, dress blues. And, and you know, not that I expected him. What, I expected him to give me a high five and a hug? No, but it was just a little bit, felt a little bit dismissive. It wasn't, you know, the most gracious, oh, nice to meet you, you know. Uh, so we're standing there. Secretary Mattis came over to speak to Kate and I, always, always very gracious and supportive. But, you know, we're kind of standing there with a lot of important people. Uh, the Secretary of State was there. Uh, well, the first one, I, I can't recall, into Trump, he came and he was very gracious. And all of a sudden, this Air Force general came over. Four stars. And, uh, and he wasn't wearing his blues. He was wearing like his service dress, like it's just his blue jacket. I, I don't know how or what's the name of that, but you know, not the dress blues, but like the, you know, his blue coat and his blue tie and uh, four stars on his collar. And uh, he came over and spoke to Kate. And, uh, and Kate said, sir, uh, let me introduce you to my husband. And he said, oh, you must be Reverend Box. I've heard so much about you. And I, I said, there, well, uh, yes, sir, uh, uh, pleasure, pleasure to meet you. He goes, oh, no, it's good, it's wonderful. I, I, we enjoy talking to Kate. Uh, she does a great job. I understand you're from Mississippi, and I served in Biloxi on, on two tours, and we really love those folks down there. What part of Mississippi are you from? Uh, well, well, sir, uh, uh, and, he, and, he, and, he, and, he, and he waved his wife, he said, honey, come here a minute. And he brought his wife over, and, and the four of us stood there, uh, and we, we talked most of the evening. And um, they were the most personable, kind-hearted people. And, and I'm just standing there going, the man's got four stars on his collar. And, um, and so finally, uh, we had come with another couple. Uh, a, a, at the time, a lieutenant colonel and his wife, where I felt like I could breathe a little bit. And uh, um, we, we finally said goodbye to the general and his wife. And I walked away and I said, Honey, that guy was great. She goes, yeah, he's really nice. And I said, who was that? And I, I, I have to admit, I don't, I can't recall the gentleman's name. But she goes, yeah, he, he's the deputy chair of the Joint Chiefs. He's number two behind Dutford. Um, he runs everything. And I'm like, that was the deputy of the chairman, uh, the deputy chairman of the Joint Chiefs staff. She goes, yeah. And I go, he's higher than Millie. She goes, yeah, he's higher than Millie. Millie's chief staff of the army. This guy, and. This man, I mean, and I would like to just say he was being generous with his time, but he honestly 
seemed to. He wanted to talk about Mississippi. He wanted to talk about all kinds of stuff. He wanted to talk about church. He was genuinely interested. Um, and, and on the way out, I, 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 I saw the Secretary of State, and I wish I could remember the gentleman's as the guy who was appointed first on the Trump administration, and he stepped down later. He was the oil guy, the business guy. And he and his wife were just standing there, and I thought, I'm going to go shake hands with the Secretary of State. Like, you know, like, I'm just going to do it. That'll be a great story. And so I just went over, and I, at the time, I called him by Mr. So-and-so, and I called him by his name, and he looked at me, and I said, sir, I'm... I'm nobody. I said, my wife works for Secretary Mattis, but I just wanted to come over and shake your hand and say hello to you. And I, I understand you're in a very difficult job. And uh, I just wanted to let you know that I'm, I'm praying for you, praying for all of the new administration, that y'all would, you know, that God would guide you and do what's best for our country. And this man looked at me and his wife did too. And he put out his hand and he said, I want to thank you for that. He said, I need your prayers. And his wife just hugged me and she said, thank you. And he says, he said, well, what do you do for us? I'm a United Methodist pastor. And he said, we're Methodist. That's what he said. Yeah, yeah, I think that's right. Said, we're Methodist. Or she grew up Methodist. There was some connection. And he said, I, he said, I tell you, I've talked to a lot of politicians around here. He said, I, I really appreciate you coming up to me like this and your prayers. And just, just as nice and easy going, you know, they're from Texas, just down home kind of people. And um, I remember that, uh, how that Air Force General had just treated us like people. Like we're equals, you know. This man, a four-star general. There's no idea what kind of decisions he has to make that affects national security and foreign policy and everything else. And the Secretary of State, good grief. You know, what, something like fourth in line to the presidency. And they were both just as kind and as gracious as they could possibly be. I mean, the next time at the Christmas party, we went and found that general and his wife again. And they were like, hey, like, it was a big time, you know. Like, we were old friends or something. And I remember that. And I think about this because um, sometimes... Those military officers, when they get up to a certain level, it's like they expect you to just act like a subordinate. You know, what was I supposed to do when I met General Milley? Come to the position of attention, salute, good afternoon. So, I mean, you know, I wasn't in uniform. Um, and that's the attitude here from Naaman. This prophet doesn't even have the common courtesy to come out and speak to me. Doesn't he know who I am? I'm the I'm commander of the entire army of Syria. <laughs> Naaman is a footnote in the history of God's people. Of all the people in Scripture and those characters in the Bible, Naaman's down here. And in the grand scheme of the kingdom of God, Elisha, is a great general. Elisha is the prophet of Israel. Handed down the mantle from Elijah. Given, poured out on him twice the, the, the blessing of Elisha's spirit. Uh, of Elijah's spirit. Elisha is actually the important person in the grand scheme of things. And Naaman doesn't understand that. Because he understands the world and the military and killing him. And Elisha understands things way beyond that. So it's, Naaman has this idea. Doesn't he know who I am? Does he have any idea who's showing up at his door and who he's dealing with? And what Naaman doesn't understand is, no, sir, it's you who don't understand who you're dealing with. No, no, Sir General, it's you have no idea whose door you're knocking on. Um, you're, you, sir, are the one who don't understand who you're talking to. And so finally, he turned away and went in rage, and his servants come near and spoke to him. And they speak to him kindly. They say, My father, 
and they just reason with him. And, and basically they say to him, this is exactly, if the prophet had told you to do something great, would you not have done it? How much more then when he says, wash and be clean? In other words, sir, I know you think this is a big deal and your life is on the line. So if he had told you to go on some great quest or to accomplish some tremendous feat, you would have done that because you were equating the difficulty of the challenge is correlate, correlative to your importance and the importance of your life. That isn't untrue. What, Eli, what Elisha is trying to teach him is, you are not that important. The difficulty and grandeur of the task is exactly correlative to who you are. You are no better or worth any more to God than your servants who are going to have to explain this to you. You're no more important, David. He has to learn humility. So he went down and dipped seven times in the Jordan, and his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child. He was clean. And it says, I think, that his flesh was restored as a little child. Jesus, of course, will remind us that we must have faith like a child. And restoring his flesh to that of a little child. Uh, now, we have to do a little bit of kind of conjecture here. But this man has been a warrior all his life. I beg your pardon. And undoubtedly, the leprosy, it doesn't tell us where on his body the leprosy was, but he had to dip his whole body in the River Jordan. And it says that his whole skin was restored to that of a little child. Not only did it wash away the leprosy, it would have washed away his scars. It would have washed away all those signs of war, all those signs of conflict, all those battle scars that he'd earned and that I'm sure he wore with a degree of pride as the general, those are gone too. And what it restores him to is like a little child, smooth, unblemished, clean. It is literally a chance to start over. And be reminded that in the grand scheme of things, we're all of equal value. New. Now, whether Naaman was able to put all that together, that's not such an issue as what do we learn from the story. And it's a reminder of our need for humility. So, uh, we come now to the story of the 70. And Jesus appoints 70 and sends them out in teams of two, so presumably doing the math, 35 teams, to go before him into every city where the Lord was planning on going. And they're going to kind of prepare the way, tell the people who's coming, tell the people kind of who he is, so that when Jesus shows up, the people have kind of heard and they might come out to see for themselves if what they've heard is true. Uh, Jesus is sending them out kind of to as a kind of a preview to market them to tell let the people know so that when he shows up people are curious oh I've heard I've heard about this let me go out and see now the 70 are very important um, we, we, we know that there were many 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 disciples of Jesus from those many disciples he chose the 12 which he called apostles we're told that specifically but from the other many, many disciples, he chose these 70. And of these 70, uh, sort of church uh, history has taught us, probably included St. Stephen, St. Matthias, and Barnabas, who would later team up with Paul. Uh, maybe John Mark, 
and maybe some other disciples who sort of come into prominence in Acts and in later times in Scripture. But we get Stephen, Barnabas, uh, and some of these more prominent others, John Mark, for example, possibly, come in um, as a part of the 70. So, that, so they're not the apostles. They are not entrusted or given that level of authority or proximity to Christ, but they are certainly being recognized as important chosen members of Christ's followers. Okay? It's a big deal. Jesus handpicked these guys. And so he says, go out there and you're going to prepare the way. Now, uh, he says, I send you out as lambs among wolves. And, and right there, he's telling you, it, it ain't going to be easy. And you may face not just hardship, but actual aggression. Okay? And now, this is a hard thing. Okay? Uh, he's also going to tell them some important things. Um... He said, whatever house you enter, first say, peace to this house. Um, is if, and, and if a son of peace is there, your peace will rest upon it. If not, it will return to you and remain in the same house, eating and drinking such things as they give. Now, uh, this is important, and John Wesley really believed in this uh, as an important point of evangelism. Because when Wesley was traveling, especially throughout England, this was a big deal. Now, what Jesus is telling him here, look, any time you're going out and you're trying to evangelize, especially in this point, who, what demographic always resonates with the message of Christ first? The poor. The poor and those in need are the most eager to hear the good news of hope and to experience the healing and the exorcisms and the preaching of of God and the news of forgiveness and grace. It's always the poor that are most eager to receive the Lord Jesus and his gospel. So if you have messengers of Christ going out, it is the poor who are in most need of his good work. And so consistently through scripture, it's the poor who are always the most eager to welcome him. And so what he's telling his followers is, when you go to town and you start, you're coming in my name, if anybody has already, oh, I've heard about this. Oh, I've heard about Jesus. I've heard of what he can do. And they say, hey, hey, you guys are with Jesus? Yeah. You, you, want, you need a place to stay? You want to stay at my house? You, you can stay at my house. More than likely, the first people to do that are going to be poor people. More than likely, it's the poor who are going to receive them first. And what Jesus is saying is, when uh, the poor come to you, and they say, you can come stay at my house. You don't wait to see if there's a better offer. You go and you stay at their house. And if you're there and you're out there evangelizing, and while you're in town, somebody else from a bigger house or a nicer place says, uh, you guys want to come on over and stay with me? I got a little more room and we eat a little better. Jesus says, uh-uh. You stay right where the people who welcomed you first. You eat what they eat. You stay where they let you stay. You be thankful for it. You remember, we're here to serve the lowest. Humility. Now this passage and these instructions were critical for John Wesley. So I've said before, Wesley had his uh, church in Bristol, which is, I mean, you know, it's kind of central England. And he had, it called New Room. And they built that church and it's a big deal. And I've been there and it's awesome. But right outside the main front door, which is in the middle of town, they built a stable. And it was a one-horse stable for Gospel, John Wesley's horse. And so Gospel was not a big horse because John Wesley was only about 5'2 or 5'4. He wasn't a real big guy. And so Gospel was, they say, like 12 or 13 hands. Not a real big horse. White horse, kind of with gray, you know, around the sides. And he would stay in that stable. And it was like Batman in the Batcave. Like whenever John Wesley got called, like get all like please come preach in wherever, he'd like get outside, pack his bags, get gospel, and he was literally right there by the front door of the church, and off he'd go. Boy, he'd be riding. 
And he and gospel, I mean, it's legendary. Like we, we found a book about it when we were in England. It's like for kids, you know. And there's this story of like he was going up to like Newcastle or somewhere in northern England. And like there's this giant lake and he needed to get across it. And so this guy comes up with a boat. He's like, look, I've got a rowboat. He's like, look, I can lend you my rowboat, but I don't know what you're going to do with your horse. And so John Wesley like, goes over there and talks to gospel, like faces up. He goes, listen, gospel, we got to go preach in Newcastle. We got to get in the boat, buddy. And gospel's like, rrr, rrr, rrr. like, you know, like, like trigger or something. And John Wesley gets gospel in the boat. And John Wesley sits underneath him and paddles the boat across the lake. And they offload. John Wesley gets back on. And they made it to Newcastle in time to preach. That happened. So um, it's these amazing stories. But John Wesley had this deal for himself and for every Methodist preacher at the time. When you go to preach, whoever offers you a place to stay, you stay there. Doesn't matter. And very often, same deal, the people who were the most excited to come out and go to the revival and hear the message were very often the very poorest. And so you had these poor people coming up to John Wesley, and here's John Wesley, Oxford educated, ordained priest in the Church of England, second generation, you know, and they're like, would you like to come stay? And he would sleep on the floor, sometimes in front of somebody's little fireplace because they had given him the warmest bed in the house. And he would stay for a week or however long that revival lasted, and he would sleep on the floor the whole time because that's who had invited him in. And other people, oh, Reverend Wesley, we didn't realize you were here. Would you like to come stay at our house? And he would say, thank you for the offer, but I'm quite comfortable where I am. And other Methodist preacher. George Whitfield was a little bit like this. Um, when they get a better offer, they, well, that would be not. And Wesley would, if he when he heard about it, he was furious. Stay where you're invited, because you remember, as a servant of God, we are no better than anyone else. All people are of equal value as children of God. And we are sent to serve and love the least, the last, and the lost, and certainly the poorest among us. And so it's that discipline of consistently remembering our humility and practicing it uh, that keeps us on the straight and narrow. And so our spiritual authority, our moral authority, is the very antithesis of authority in the world, which is based on prestige and money and position and power. You know, who are you in the world? You're somebody. Who are we in the church? We're a child of God. We're a child of God. And so, we, in order to be humble, we have to be intentional about practicing that humility. We have to work on it. And uh, John Wesley struggled with that. I think that's why he was so intentional. So he and Charles uh, were both got to go to Oxford. And that's a big deal. I mean, you know, it's, it's like going to Harvard or Yale or West Point or something. It's a big deal. And it was a big deal back then. And so they're at, Oxford's weird. Like, I've been there to visit. It doesn't work like a normal, like an American university. What they got is it's the town of Oxford. And they've got all these little colleges of various sizes jammed together. And when you apply to the university, then they kind of look at which college would accept you and fit you into. And some of them are big and real prestigious and have a lot of money like Modlin or Christ Church. And some of them are real small and real exclusive like Trinity. And some of them are newer and maybe not as famous. Like, well, it's not my place. They're all good schools. But there are some that are more prominent and more famous than others. And the two big ones have traditionally been Christ Church, which is the oldest, and Magdalene. And Christ Church is where the cathedral is. Because when it was founded, that was the first college founded. And that's where the bishop presides. Every college has a chapel. 
but the chapel at Christ Church is where the bishop is, so it's a cathedral. And this is where John and Charles both went to Christ Church. John and Charles were ordained in the cathedral there at Christ Church. It's a big deal. John was a teacher. He became a professor at Lincoln College there in Oxford. His daddy was a priest. And he, I mean, John was known to be a very good academic. So while they're at Oxford and they're student, and, it, and Oxford's weird. Like if you're a student at Oxford, they got butlers and maids and stuff. Like you, you know, they make up your bed for you. They get you, it's like they treat you like you're, you know, of the peerage. And uh, there was a student there who was there on merit. And he, the only way he could be there is he had to work. He served as a busboy in the cafeteria for the other students. And Oxford, and at that time, England, very class conscious. And so this student who works, the other students didn't even talk to him. Didn't even, mm -mm, he's lower class. And so as John and Charles and, and I can think maybe Coke and Ed, I don't know who all was there, but they started the Methodist movement in Oxford. And this young guy who was a very faithful and excited, this bus boy wanted to join the Methodists for their Bible studies. And John said, no. And Charles says, what are you talking about? And John says, he's not one of us. He's lower class. And Charles says, are you reading this Bible? I mean, we go to Bible study every week, but are you reading this thing? You're not going to let the guy in because he's poor. And so it was a real moment and one of the few recorded arguments between John and Charles, and Charles was a little older than John, a little bit bigger, and finally he was like, you're letting the kid in. Y'all want to guess who it was? It was George Whitfield, who became arguably the most famous evangelist in American history. He went out into the countryside, crossed the Atlantic, and converted more people than arguably any other preacher in American history. Um, he and John eventually kind of parted ways theologically, but there I mean, some of the finest sermons ever written from that period, George Whitfield. He would go out and preach in towns, just get a box and stand and preach in corners in America and bring people to tears and convert them. A powerful instrument of the gospel. And so John had to learn, and he had to, kind of like Naaman, get off his high horse and understand that we are all children of God. And I think that brings us uh, to today's passage from Galatians. And Paul here is addressing how do we love one another and hold each other accountable in Christian love. Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, and, and let's just break that down. If a man is living in sin and he can't seem to overcome it, he's overtaken by any trespass. You who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. In other words, you better remember your own sin. You better remember your own frailty and propensity to temptation. And so you've got to go and restore. We've got to maintain moral, spiritual standards. But we have to hold each other accountable in love and encourage one another in our faith. Now... If the brother is, let's say, struggling with something like alcoholism, then don't necessarily send someone who is also an alcoholic to help them. All right? Now, you might send him in a group. Listen, brother, I know what you're going through. And I understand. That's how AA works, right? They have somebody in AA to kind of sponsor to help them. 
but you don't want to just send somebody in there who may themselves struggle and be tempted also. And so you don't also want to go in there with condemnation. Um, you know, anytime I've heard good accountability, someone is also humble about their own struggles. You know, if I had to deal with someone who was struggling with alcoholism, I think the first thing I want to do is talk about the elephant in the room, and that's my own struggle with gluttony. Brother, I struggle with addiction to sugar. I struggle with addiction to food. I understand that this is a struggle, and God loves you. But he loves you enough he doesn't want you to kill yourself with that bottle any more than he wants me to kill myself with food and sugar. And that's not good for us. It's not good for the community. It's not good for our families. It's not to get in there and shake your finger and say, oh, you have really sinned. You're terrible. But it's rather to say, God calls us with these rules and regulations and commandments and morality to save us from our own self-destruction. And we love you. And God has, we are all struggling in some degree. And let us help one another with our struggles. Um, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. And that's the lesson Naaman has to learn. And that's what Jesus is teaching the 70. You go in. You stay wherever they invite you, and you stay there the whole time. And here's the other thing that we got to learn from the gospel today. Jesus sends, I mean, hand picks 70, two by two, to go out and be his emissaries and lead the way for his visit, to prepare the way for his visit. Can you imagine the honor that that would be? You're sitting there and the Son of God comes to you and says, Carl, you're the guy. And I'm going to team you up with Howard. And I'm going to send y'all down there to wherever. And y'all are going to represent me and get them ready for my visit. Son of God handpicks you and calls you by name. That's a big deal. Change your life. I mean, from then on, your children would tell stories about it. The church would tell stories about it. Your children, your grandchildren, my dad, my granddad was handpicked by Jesus <clears throat> to be one of the 70. What a big deal that would be. All right. And what does Jesus say? Your name will be famous and you will be glorified and congratulations, you've won the spiritual lottery. No, what he says is I send you out as lambs among the wolves. In other words, some of y'all may not come back. You're going to have a rough road to hoe. It's going to be tough out there. This is no prize you're winning. You're getting a tough assignment. And also remember this. You can expect to fail. That's what Jesus tells them. Now, if they don't accept you, you shake the dust of your feet and the whole bit. He gives them this whole instruction on what to do when it doesn't work. And so I think there's a little bit of humility in that. Jesus is sending us all out to be ambassadors of the gospel. Do not expect success. And understand that ultimately them coming to faith is not about you. You may play a part in it, but you may not see the fruits of the seeds you plant. So, you know, I mean, there's plenty of times when uh, I feel like I'm up there preaching. And, you know, some weeks are busy. Y'all know how that goes. And as, I, as Father Tim used to tell me, you're not going to hit a triple every time you're about, you know. But there are times when I think, well, I've, I've pretty good sermon. Pretty good. And I won't get any response. Doesn't it seem like I was just up there barking in the wind. And it has taken, there have been times when it has taken years. Someone will finally come and say, you know, I've been listening a long time. 
and I feel like God is calling me for this. Or I feel like this. Or Reverend Box, you said, I remember one long time ago in a sermon, you said this and that bothered me and I've been praying on that. Sometimes you don't see fruition for years, especially if you're a Methodist, because they used to move us about every three years. And a lot of times the old preachers used to tell the young ones, son, your job is to plant seeds. It's probably not going to be you who reaps the harvest. And if you do get to be the one to reap some of the harvest, you just remember those seeds were planted long ago by other people. It's a team. But all of it is the work of God. And that's important for all of us. Jesus tells us a sower went out to sow. And he sowed the seed all over the place, on the road, next to the road, in the thorns, in the good ground, in the stony ground. He just threw seed everywhere. Now, if you were honestly working on a farm, you'd fire a sower like that because he's just wasting seed, not throwing it in the good ground. But God is the reaper, and he wants to get every bit of crop he can get. He'll reap it in the stony ground. He'll reap it in the good ground. He'll reap it in the thorny ground. He'll reap it in the road if it'll grow. You don't know where that seed's going to grow. All your job is, is to go out and throw seed. Throw seed by what you say. Throw seed by the witness you bear. Throw seed by the example you set. Remember that you are being sent and whatever you do and wherever you go and whoever you're with, you are sowing seed. That's all. The reaping and the growing, well, that's up to the Lord. But don't ever think that we're too good to sow seed anywhere for anybody. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's close today with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you.